Okay, so the, it's on, right? I can hear myself. Okay, great. Um, I have a lot of slides to go through, and I know Dr. Edney doesn't think I'm going to get through them all, but uh, we'll see how we do. Uh, and I'm conscious of the fact I'm, not, I'm the only person up here who's not a doctor, so uh, don't hold that against me. Mine will be less research-focused and um, more practical uh, discussion. And we got whistling here. Are we all right? We're whistling. Oh, maybe that's not me. That's, oh, it's another room. Okay, we're fine then. Um, so I'm going to talk about decision-making and long-term care and what are the rules um, that we have to look at. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with our office, I did provide some pamphlets, and if you haven't got one, there's some on the table here you can get afterwards. I also have a few fridge magnets, if anybody wants one, I have them up here. Um, if you're not receiving our newsletter, um, you can certainly uh, contact our office, and hopefully this, uh, these slides will be available to you. And you can get the newsletter sent to you by email or um, uh, by mail. So in uh, our office, we do uh, have a number of different documents um, that uh, are sort of pertain to this issue. Um, we do have a new Long-Term Care Homes Act sort of primer. It's 20 pages um, information about the legislation. The Every Resident uh, man, uh, book that uh, many of you are familiar with, it is being revised with respect to the new legislation, so that should be available uh, hopefully in the next month or so. If you haven't uh, received the uh, tool on capacity and consent, I have a few here. The NICE uh, network table has a number as well, um, but it's something that if you are um, a health practitioner, you should have one of these. It gives you all the information about substitute decision making um, at your fingertips, and they're absolutely wonderful and they're free of charge. All these documents I'm showing you are free. And the Guide to Advanced Care Planning, that's uh, available through the Senior Secretariat. And it uh, provides information about advanced care planning and the legislation. Again, it's available from Senior Secretariat free of charge. So what are the problems that we run into in, in health care consent and advanced care planning in long-term care? So as a practitioner, what I do is I represent clients in long-term care homes. And advanced care planning issues um, and substitute decision-making issues are ones that come up to me a lot. So the things that we run into are uh, the use of the patient's wishes inappropriately. Uh, so where practitioners just look at the wishes, uh, they may not be interpreting them correctly, uh, not applying to the consent capacity board when they should. The use of level of care forms as consents or as advanced care planning documents. So if you're in a home and you have those level of care directives or forms, um, instead of going to the person or their substitute, you just simply staple them to the front and look at that. That is not how these documents are, are to be used, and we'll be talking about that. Having patients pre-consent or sign blanket consents to treatment uh, so, you know, when people are admitted to homes, signing a document that says, you know, I consent to anything that the doctor orders, that is not legal. Um, or believing that, the, that you require an attorney for personal care, so that an attorney for personal care is the only substitute. And under our legislation, the Health Care Consent Act, there are many uh, people who might be a substitute and if you don't have a power of attorney for personal care, there's always someone else, if you're incapable, that would be the substitute. So what's governed by the Health Care Consent Act? That is treatment, and that's in any sector, so it um, doesn't matter where you are, uh, whether it's in your doctor's office, in a hospital, or long-term care home. Admission to long-term care homes. And personal assistance services in long-term care homes, and that's things like uh, mobility, bathing, feeding, um, and that is specifically only, that section only applies to long-term care. It does not apply to hospital, doesn't apply to retirement homes uh, at the present time anyway. So what is treatment? So the, the uh, Health Care Consent Act defines treatment, um, which is here, I'm not going to read it. And it also says what it doesn't include. So it doesn't include things like taking of a health history, capacity assessments under the HCC or the SDA, um, different kinds of treatment that may uh, pose a little or no risk of harm. Um, I'm always uh, very cautious around that one. I think that people should be very cautious in using those. 
So what is decision making? So before providing a treatment, a healthcare pr practitioner has to get informed consent or refusal of consent of treatment from the patient if they're capable. So if you're uh, looking at a, an issue of treatment, um, you do have to get consent beforehand. If the person is not capable, then you have to get consent from the substitute. And consent always comes from a person and not a piece of paper. So you can't say, well, you know, someone signed a level of care directive or something when they were capable. We'll just look to that. You have to actually go to the substitute if the person is not capable. The only exception to that is an emergency. Clearly, if someone requires emergency treatment, you have to get that now and not, um, you know, phone someone up. So if someone requires, for example, CPR, you can't be phoning up the family and trying to round up some substitute consent. The patient, if um, they are mentally capable, is always the decision maker. And this is an issue in long-term care. We often get people who say, well, I don't want to make a decision. You ask my daughter. Well, the substitute's decision may, I mean, the, the patient's decision may be that they're going to do whatever the daughter tells them, but the actual decision has to come from the person. And when you're um, a, the patient yourself, you can make a decision in any way you want. You can toss, you know, you can flip a coin if you want. You know, do I want the treatment? Not. You can flip a coin. Um, they can do whatever their children tell them if that's the way they want to make their decision. But at the end of the day, they do have to uh, make their own decision. And they can also express wishes about the health, their future health treatment, and that's called advanced care planning. And it's advanced care planning, as I said, is not a consent. Wishes are not decisions. Um, and even if an advanced care plan exists, consent or refusal must come from a person. If the person isn't mentally capable, then it's their substitute decision maker that's uh, the person who's going to make that decision. They can only, um, a substitute can only consent or refuse consent to a treatment based on offered treatments. They cannot advance care plans. So when a client or a substitute comes to us, for, so families often come to us and say, you know, I've got an advanced care um, document, a level of care directive I'm being asked to sign by the home, um, we advise them that they cannot sign those documents because an advanced uh, care plan cannot be signed by a substitute. Uh, if the substitute knows of uh, wishes, um, such as an advanced care plan made by the patient, then uh, they have to comply with that. And if there's no wishes that are known, they have to go to the best interest. Consent can be to a specific treatment or consent can be to a plan of treatment. And this is where often there's confusion with respect to what the substitute can do because a substitute can consent to a plan of treatment. And that plan of treatment, for example, could include a um, decision whether or not you're going to have a CPR if that's something that's based on their health condition of the patient right now. So they can't say, well, someday if they might need something, uh, you know, uh, a surgery you might want, you know, will consent now. They can't do that. So as a person, I can say, well, you know, if I was ever in a hospital, I wouldn't want to be put on tubes, um, you know, or hooked up to machines or something like that. I can say that. My substitute can't do that. They can only make those decisions at the time when that's being offered. You know, do we want to put a person on that? Now, the difference is, is that if you are... Um, the substitute, you can say, well, you know, my, my, uh, my dad, who I'm the decision maker for, he has a heart condition, and it's very likely based upon his condition that his heart is going to stop. Do I want to have CPR or not? And that would be part of the plan of treatment. So the plan of treatment is something that's developed by a number, one or more health practitioners, may deal with a number of health problems, and provides for the administration um, to the person of various treatments or courses of treatments, it includes the withholding or withdrawal of treatment in light of the current, person's current health condition. And that's the important part. The substitute can only make a decision based upon the current health condition. So in the past, now I haven't seen them uh, recently, we used to see tick boxes. So you could, um, for example, people would tick, you know, uh, my father has um, uh, schizophrenia, do not resuscitate. Those two things have nothing to do with each other and you couldn't make that decision. Now, my father has um, 
you know, some kind of a heart condition and we've discussed it with the health practitioner and the health practitioner doesn't think it's a good idea or I don't think it's a good idea that they be resuscitated because the outcome isn't good. You could consent based on that because it's based on the person's current health condition. So a person can give an informed consent to treatment that takes place or is withheld in the future if the decision for that treatment is re- relevant considering the present health condition. Um, this is not advanced care planning, but a consent. So when you're basing it on your health condition, it's not advanced care planning. Valid consent, hopefully you know those. It has to relate to the treatment, be informed, involuntary, and not obtained through misrepresentation or fraud. And you have to provide information to the patient or their substitute um, under the Health Care Consent Act. Um, and these are the things that you have to provide if you are uh, getting informed consent. Um, as I said, in Ontario, in, uh, consent comes from people, not from the piece of paper. And if the person is capable, they consent. Um, and it's up to the healthcare practitioner to determine if that person is capable. So it's up to the healthcare practitioner who's offering the treatment. You don't need a capacity assessor. You don't need a psychiatrist. It's up to the health practitioner. So if it's a physician offering the treatment, proposing the treatment, it's up to them to decide whether or not the person is capable. And that's not a specific test. It's not something that, uh, you know, there's a form to fill out or anything like that. It's up to the, the, the person who's proposing the treatment to decide whether or not the person understands and appreciates the treatment. Um, they have to get those, and again, wishes are not decisions. So wishes are things that are speculative. Um, so they're the what-if situation. So what if, if I had a terminal illness, what would I want? If I had deven- dementia, what would I want? They're not based on facts. And those are the things that we can make, but we can't make for others. Advanced care planning, it usually involves the selection of a person, so someone in a power of attorney for personal care to be a substitute. It can also simply describe the treatment or care that the person wants um, when they're not uh, mentally capable. And again, if a person is capable, you would always go to them to make that decision. Um, You don't look at the form. Uh, It could focus on end-of-life treatment or it could focus on any kind of treatment, but obviously the most common is the end-of-life treatment. Advanced care planning provides information to the substitute because it's the substitute decision maker who's going to be interpreting that. It's up to the substitute to say, okay, when my mom said she didn't want um, to be hooked up to a machine, what did she mean? Did she mean something for a short term or did she really mean a long term? I don't want to end up on a ventilator for the rest of my life. And those are really different things um, and different decisions to be making.